he has luck on his side. At the same time, he's very logical. He can normally get himself out of any situation. I always say to myself, if one day it does happen that he does have a mistake and the odds come against him, he's at least doing what he loves the best. It's his passion. He may be the world's greatest solo adventurer, but Mike Horn is never alone. Kathy is my biggest sponsor. What she gives me as the freedom to do what I do. She's at the heart of every expedition. A nurse from New Zealand, Kathy Horn met her husband in the Swiss Alps, where they live today. A little bit shy, which I quite liked, uh, um, but he loved doing crazy things. By 1998, Mike was married and the father of two small girls. He told his wife he wanted to be the first man to follow the equator around the world using only his own resources. I wasn't really sure what I, what I thought about it. Um, uh, I needed some time to think about it. He planned to leave from the West African country of Gabon, sailing across the Atlantic to Brazil. Why are you going on the ocean? You haven't had enough experience. And he just laughs it off and he goes, it's easy, anybody can do it. From there, he would traverse the continent to the coast of Ecuador. I had the confidence. I knew that I could cross the Amazon jungle again. He would sail across the Pacific to Indonesia, cross the Indian Ocean to Africa, and traverse the continent back to Gabon. All you have to do is go across continents, and in between all of that, there's just a bit of water. Once he set his mind on something, he's going to do it. I had always loved traveling, and the advantage of this was that I would be able to carry on traveling, even though I had young children, uh, and support him and help him doing something, which was quite remarkable. So I, in, in the end, I, I said, OK, let's go for it. All I had to know now is I had to know how to sail. He was introduced to the sea on one of the fastest ships in the world. Frenchman Laurent Bonillon had set a transatlantic record aboard Primagaz. In 1997, he invited Mike to join his crew for one of Europe's most prestigious races. I've had very physically strong men on board before. Rugby players, highly trained athletes. But Mike is above the norm. He doesn't get tired. He's like a machine. I didn't know actually what was happening. And when they asked me to winch, I had to winch. And when they asked me to move a sail, I moved the sail. All I did was winch and winch and winch and winch. I said, I want to sail myself. We had a long discussion about it. We needed a boat that was sturdy but easy to operate. Because Mike is kind of a brute. Yeah, this is a flying machine. They settled on a 28 foot trimaran intended for coastal navigation and freshwater sailing. He named it after the expedition Latitude Zero. He left June 2nd, 1999, after a year of planning. And all of a sudden, you're alone. You pull up the sails, and the boat starts moving. Well, life is great. Armed with a global positioning system, a satellite telephone, and an emergency SOS beacon, he prepared for a month-long crossing. Alone on the ocean, he didn't sleep for the first four days. The boat was going at 19, 20, until 25 knots. That's a lot. This boat of mine's going too fast. And where's the handbrake? Where, how can I slow it down? He would teach himself the basics of sails and speed on the open ocean. By accident, he returned to the mouth of the Amazon in record time. OK, give me a flash. Yes, I can see you. Now, it was amazing. He crossed the Atlantic in 19 days, I think it was. Hey. 
water, is everything okay? I just said, well, I needed this experience to sail across the Pacific because the next time I get onto my boat, I've got three months of ocean in front of me. It would be six months before he saw his boat again. From the coast of Brazil, he followed the equator into the heart of South America. Some places, the jungle is so thick that the sun has never penetrated and touched the ground. He walked for weeks without human contact, living off the land. During the rainy season, much of the Amazonian rainforest becomes a patchwork of swamps and canals. Mike traded some of his equipment for a pirogue, a small wooden canoe. I just kind of hacked my way through the, uh, through the bush, and there was this branch just in front of me. And, you know, with the machete, I just chopped the branch. Basically, I felt that I, I hit my hand against something. A couple of meters further, I felt that I had a bottle of whiskey. You know, my head started turning and I said, am I dehydrated? What's happening to me? He had been bitten by a poisonous snake. I'm losing a lot of feeling in my face and I'm losing a lot of feeling around my eyes and I'm starting to see blur. I'm dying. He managed to treat himself with an antivenin, an antidote for the poison. He considered cutting off his finger, but after five days of rest, the effects of the poison went away. Now I have to change my goal. My goal is not to reach the other side. My goal is to stay alive. Several months into his journey, he called Kathy and asked for the camera crew to be flown out to meet him. It took us, I think, in all about seven or eight days to find Mike. This is our second day on the river, I think. No. Third day. Yeah. Yep. In fact, Mike had to find them. We had some Indians with us, and they said, we haven't been here for 10 years. So, you know, this was a really lost bit of jungle. And I remember we suddenly heard this, hey, from the really from miles away. How's it, Mike? How are you guys doing, man? All right, how are you? All right. And Mike, by this time, of course, he's, he's as hard as nails. If you're not disciplined, if you don't know how to look, if you don't know how to listen, life can become very shorter than that adventure. Mike rang me up as he was going into the area of the, the drug lords. That might have been one of the scariest moments of my life, meeting somebody that had the power to kill me.